The audience seems to have thinned a little bit for what I think is the most interesting topic of the day. Nevertheless, I think people will filter back in. I'm Charles Platt, a member of the Municipal Art Society's Board of Directors and an architect that I must admit has designed in and around New York City hundreds and hundreds, maybe even more than a thousand of publicly, federally subsidized housing units of what, looking back, we now see were and are of questionable sustainability. Although we cared deeply as architects about what and for whom we were designing back then, despite early and quite recognizable warnings, we just weren't geared up as a profession industry or society to see or understand the imperative of designing or building for sustainability. Therefore, I think a bit of penance in my part, I'm doing, doing it by being here, it is fitting that I am here to learn and consider with you what might be done at this time to try to get things right to look forward with you to hear this very distinguished panel discuss sustainable housing development in New York City and how the government, private and not-for-profit sectors can work together to create safe, affordable, sustainable housing for every New Yorker. Our moderator for the panel is Gerilyn Perrine, Executive Director of the Citizens Housing and Planning Council, where she directs efforts to improve public debate and public policy, promote new ideas, and engage New Yorkers to improve the city's neighborhoods. She has been Commissioner of the Department of Housing Preservation and Development under two mayors, and is the author of Mayor Bloomberg's New Housing Marketplace Plan, plan for more than 65,000 units of affordable housing. Julia Vitulo Martin is, uh, this is the panel now, it is a senior fellow at the Regional Plan Association and director of the Center for Urban in Innovation. Julia has taught and published widely. She's the author of Breaking Away, The Future of Cities, she has filled city agency, advisory council, fellowship positions, and directorships, but is perhaps best known for directing the Center for Rethinking Development at the Manhattan Institute. Architect Paul Freitag is a LEED accredited professional, that's L-E-E-D. He is an authority on redeveloping properties for affordable housing and using green design in, <clears throat> in housing projects. Paul led the Via Verde project in the South Bronx, the winning response to the New Housing New York Legacy competition. Bomi Jung, an urban planner, is the Green Community Program Director for Enterprise, which provides innovative development capital for rebuilding communities and creating affordable housing. Her work encompasses promoting green and sustainable affordable houses. Bomi was also the founder of Green Home NYC, a nonprofit that promotes green building through volunteerism. Unfortunately, the last panel member, Sheena Wright, the president and CEO of the Abyssinian Development Corporation is traveling and her plans went askew and she is not being able to be here. So with that, I will turn you over to Gerilyn and the panel. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited that you're here today and I'm particularly excited to be here with this panel. Um, you have three people who are really innovators in ideas and practice around affordable housing and sustainability. And um, you know, there's a lot of talk around sustainability, but uh, I think you'll find that you know, the, the panelists here are people who have actually affected the built environment in pretty dramatic ways. 
So I wanted to get you to think about something before we start, which is, as you hear people, um, think about a few things. One is that the closest thing that New York City has to a plan for sustainability is Plan YC, which is something that I think um, you know, the Mayor Bloomberg and his administration should really be proud of. Um, and while I'm sure there's always uh, something in every plan for somebody to you know, disagree with, um, it, it lays out a vision for the future that is provocative and interesting and really important. So if you look at the housing goals, um, you know, it's pretty great. Uh, create homes for almost a million more New Yorkers while making housing more affordable and sustainable. And those are, those are great ideas. How could we actually do it, however? Um, the way both, well, first of all, one thing to think about is the words sustainable and affordable are kind of undefinable. Um, if we did a little survey and made you all write down a definition, I doubt that two of you would, would come up with the same definition for each, so you got to keep that in mind. But the model for affordability has really remained unchanged for decades. You build something, it costs a certain amount of money. If you want to make it affordable to people who can't pay that much, you use a variety of fairly complicated, usually government subsidies, uh, in order to close that gap. That's been the model for you know, 75 years. Um, on sustainability, the ideas have mostly been around you know, buying more things that you could add on to this construction process, which will then make something greener. Um, again, with an idea towards those gaps, those financial gaps that open up, will then be paid for by government in some way. Um, one of the things I'd like you to ask yourselves is whether those two models themselves are sustainable. Um, how do we achieve this? So, you know, what get, gets you into a lot, I think, is this world of lead certification and kind of a product placement idea, and there's very little discussion about overall construction costs, how do the increasing total construction costs in New York City, which are the highest in the country, how do they contribute to the complexity around sustainability, and that's something that um, Julia will talk about. The other is that you know the biggest impact that you can actually have um, on the environment is to live in smaller spaces and live in a shared household. Um, so all the you know bottled water which is here which we shouldn't touch or you know drink I'm, we're not going to drink it um, <laughs> all the bikes you want to ride all the bamboo floors you want to install all the solar panels none of it all added up will improve the environment as much or create as big a contribution as if we all lived in smaller spaces shared spaces and used mass transit so housing is something that has to be cooled um, it has to be heated. The less of it that you consume, the better off you'll be. So, you know, Bill Gates' house, very nice, very green, 66,000 square feet for four people. I don't know, I'm just saying, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe could have been a little greener in a slightly different way. Um, I'd like you to think about housing as a commodity, just the way you think about it in terms of your other green initiatives. And so, as you overconsume it, um, you're not very green. In New York City, 33% of our households are occupied by single people living alone. In Manhattan, that number is almost half. Half the apartments in Manhattan are occupied by single persons living alone. And since a single person living alone consumes 53% more energy than a single person who lives with other people, um, this is an overconsumption of housing. Now, we've also got the opposite in New York, which is an underconsumption of housing. So we estimate that there's about 750,000 households in New York City that are living in a fairly complex shared environment with at least one other head of household, and that's somebody over the age of 25. Um, so, and how does this happen? Well, again, if we think about green, you know, cities have always been green, and, and I actually nicked this data from Jonathan Rose. So, uh, but if you take a household and they live in a house in the suburbs, 
they're going to consume almost three times the amount of energy that if you took that same household in the same size space, but just move that space into a multiple dwelling inside a city. So why has this happened? Well, for 100 years, housing policy, and certainly since the 50s, um, has basically advocated the idea that the larger space you live in, the better off you are. And this is who you know, we're building for. So you know, slightly creepy dad, chain smoking mom, you know, um, many non-green elements to this household, obviously. But, um, but yet, it's the housing type that we continue to build for this demographic. And we want it to be bigger. So in the last 25 years, the average size of a housing unit in America has increased by 34%. We just, we just can't seem to get enough. Now, but how people actually live and how they share, we like to imagine that they all share in this way. But those 750,000 households in New York City also share this way, and they share like this, and like this. And a lot of this is driven by the fact that sharing is essentially outlawed in New York. It's illegal in New York for more than three unrelated adults to live together. Um, and that's always a fact that then there's always somebody, see, it looks like you. You're living that way, right? Right? Yeah. OK. I'm no longer in government, so it's OK. I'm not going to report you. But there's always the person that goes, oh, really? Jeez, you know? Um, and yes, it's illegal. And so we have basically capped innovation in the private sector. In other places in the world, cities around the world, are rethinking how we're using space on the inside and how to accommodate different kinds of shared households and how to use even housing for a single person in a much more effective and a much greener way. That sadly is not really happening here. Um, we're not examining how we use space on the inside. Uh, and we're not doing it because it causes people to come to your house with pitchforks and torches, as, as happened to, to us. We continue to advocate for these kinds of ideas, um, but they're not popular. Um, but until we start to tackle some of the bigger, more complex, and harder bits of sustainability, um, I think we're always going to just be sort of buying new products. Um, so with that, I'll turn you over to our, our other very provocative a panelist who's Julia Vitula Martin, and one of the things that got left out of Julia's biography is that Julia wrote, I think, the most important book about New York City, which is called oh, New York Ascendant. And you. it was co-authored with Bobby Wagner Jr. in 1987 as part of the Commission on the Year 2000. And it's really a book that, I mean, it was brilliant then, and it still really holds up today, and um, I encourage you to try to go find a copy. But Julia. Okay, thank you, Darylin. Um, so what does it mean to be sustainable? At its base, sustainability, sustainability means we can afford to do it. So costs have to be something that come up very early in the discussion. Um, as everybody in the room knows, New York City, by environmental criteria, is uh, probably the most sustainable city in America. But what makes New York less than sustainable? It's very high costs. High costs of living, high costs of doing business, and high costs of construction. Now, every study ever done of comparative construction costs in this country has shown New York to be disproportionately expensive. Um, it's substantially more expensive to build here than in um, top competitor cities and union-dominated cities like Chicago and Boston. And of course, it's ludicrously more expensive to build here than in um, non-union cities like Dallas. And a few years ago, um, this didn't matter so much because, I mean, in my view, actually, it always mattered. But um, it wasn't thought to matter so much because New York had so much going for it and seemed to be so extraordinarily competitive that, you know, so what if second-rate cities were substantially cheaper to build? Um, now we're in a very different environment. Um, the economy's not good. Our future is looking a little bleak. And some of these other cities are looking extremely attractive. Um, a couple of years ago, or, Last year, Hope, I think, right? We had, um, at the Manhattan Institute, we had uh, 
the mayor of London here in New York at a Thinking Big conference, Thinking Big London in New York, and um, Mayor Boris Johnson made the sort of astonishing comment that the city he feared the most in America was Chicago. And that was because um, Chicago has taken quite a few businesses away from London. Chicago apparently is regarded as very attractive and orderly and clean and uh, by Brits. And of course, it has magnificent transportation and so forth. Now, um, uh, a couple of years ago at the Manhattan Institute, Hope Cohen, who's in the audience, and Rosemary Scanlon did a study. It's one of the few studies ever done of construction costs in New York. And they compared New York to Chicago. Um, New York at that time had construction costs of 352 a square foot and Chicago 163. Um, now I looked up um, a couple of more recent studies, um, RS Means, New York City uh, commercial one-story building, so in other words minimizing the impact of Manhattan one story. New York City $215 a square foot Chicago, 187, LA, 176, you know, I'm, you know, important competitor cities, Washington, DC, 162, Dallas, 139. Now, you might think Dallas is not uh, competing with New York, but actually it is. Everybody's now competing with New York. Um, and what contributes to the high cost of, con of construction in New York? A actually, everything. That's what makes it so hard to reform this area. Every single factor is higher in New York. So land, of course, um, and the national rule of thumb for land in relation to total costs is that land is roughly 70% of uh, final total cost, so that counts. Materials, um, so construction materials are more expensive in New York and they're very expensive to move around the city. Um, this is one of those areas in which, you know, maybe the Bloomberg administration should re really be rethinking waterfront policy and the sustainability of barges and barge transportation because that is the cheapest way to move construction, uh, heavy construction equipment around New York. Um, uh, regulations, uh, every builder in New York will tell you that the, since the crane accidents, the Bloomberg administration, the Department of Buildings has become extremely aggressive about shutting down construction sites, even over very minor things like uh, a laborer smoking. You know, this is, these are very costly, um, these kinds of actions. Uh, permitting and land use regula regulations, very extensive and onerous in New York. Um, and to this, we may soon be adding uh, community benefit agreements, mandatory community benefit agreements. Now, you may well think, you know, CBAs are good because why shouldn't communities be able to take, you know, developers make a lot of money, why shouldn't communities get their cut off the top? There may well be an argument to be made there, but the truth is that's going to be one more costly layer on top of all of these other costly layers. There is nothing in construction that's cheaper here than elsewhere. Um, now, Hope, Hope Cohen and I have been doing, have just started a study a few months ago of um, one aspect, and that's labor costs. Uh, because this is an area extremely expensive, uh, disproportionately so, and it's an area in which actually there is something that can be done because labor costs can be renegotiated. And we've done something sort of unusual with this study. We've simply taken as a given the high costs of um, wages and benefits and said, okay, they are what they are. We're not even going to look at that. What we're going to look at are the uncompetitive practices um, whether they're part of a contract or they're part of tradition. Um, we're looking at um, uh, jurisdictional disputes by which uh, a site gets shut down or the work just doesn't get done because there's a dispute about whether an electrician should do something or a carpenter should do something. And by the way, in New York, we're very accustomed to jurisdictional disputes and we think it's the way of the world. Well, it's not. They don't have these kinds of disputes in our competitive cities like Washington or, or even Baltimore. No jurisdictional disputes. So these other cities that are up and coming, 
um, are up and coming with a competitive advantage over us. Um, we, as part of this study, we looked at um, a pair of matched residential towers that have just gone up, um, one built union and one non-union. The union building, 30 stories, it took 30 months to build, $365 a foot. Um, the second tower, 28 stories, non-union, 36 months to build, $280 a square foot. So huge difference. And the builder believes uh, that his second building, the non-union building, um, is a better building because he didn't have jurisdictional disputes. So he didn't have fights about who was going to be putting in the kitchen cabinets. He didn't have vandalism when he'd made the wrong decision about who was going to put in the kitchen cabinets, and he thinks he's got a better building. And um, we may be seeing a sort of revolution in New York. I mean, this is a very quiet thing that's happening right now in which many former union contractors are moving in a non-union direction. And um, if this happens, it's going to have a tremendous effect on cost of construction in New York. Um, now, if green is our objective, and I think in many ways it should be, um, we have to get away from the idea that buildings cost what they cost and that government is simply going to make up the difference. Um, government isn't going to be making up the difference for very much longer. That's, I think that's really pretty clear. Um, and I'd like to introduce an idea that I heard Phil Howard make the other day, and that is he, he was talking at his um, Common Ground event, and he attacked what he called the fallacy of permanence. That is, he said, we don't have to live tomorrow the way we're living today. We don't have to have the same contracts tomorrow that we had yesterday. Our laws don't have to be permanent, and nothing else has to be permanent. And in fact, of course, we live in a great deal, we live in a society with a great deal of impermanence, but we somehow accept permanence where we shouldn't. And I think the high cost of construction in New York is one of those areas in which we have accepted permanent dysfunction and we should no longer do so. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. No, thank you. Um, Paul Freitag from Jonathan Rose Companies is um, the one actual uh, builder on our panel who, although he doesn't actually have a tool belt on, he's, he's actually a person that can build affordable housing and sustainable housing and has built some of the best examples of this um, in our city. Um, so what I'd like to do, actually, I'm, I'm going to speak very briefly, and hopefully this will advance. Uh, do you have that big, big, big I am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not. Is uh, it not? It's not working. Oh, here we go. Okay, oh, great. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm going to speak extremely briefly. I'm going to just take a minute to introduce Jonathan Rose Companies so you can understand the context out of which my viewpoints come. And then I'm going to talk just really to show some images and give some examples of projects that we're working on sort of by category. And my whole point is really just to give you all some reference images that as we have a discussion later, there's something that you can think back to. So Jonathan Rose Companies is a full service real estate company. We've been around for about 20 years. Um, Jonathan formed the company. Jonathan is a third generation real estate developer. He is a part of the family that uh, is Rose Associates. But in the late 1980s, he formed his own company, um, very much with the idea of trying to blend disparate elements in his life into sort of one, one effort. And at that point in time, Jonathan felt very passionate about two different things. He felt very passionate about real estate. And he also felt very passionate about what would have been known in the late 1980s as environmentalism. And his idea was to really figure out how could he have a company that was going to advance real estate, real estate development, but do so in a way that was environmentally sustainable. So you know, today we actually have words to say this idea. You know, when Jonathan actually started this company 20 years ago, you know, this was a totally foreign concept. It was you know, something from Mars. Um, and so it's, what's interesting is that you know, we, we're in an unusual situation that Jonathan's really been doing this for you 
you know, two decades, and he hasn't really changed his focus, but the whole world has changed. And so it's put us in sort of a very unusual position of having extensive credibility because we were doing lead-like buildings that actually could have, you know, can be retroactively lead certified in the early 90s prior to lead even existing. So Jonathan's concept behind our company is that we're a mission-based for-profit real estate company and our mission is to repair the fabric of communities while preserving the land around them. And his idea is he has this concept of the total city. So we actually have four practice groups which are represented by this slide. Um, one of our practice groups is a planning group that engages in large-scale master planning, helping cities, institutions develop, and neighborhoods develop green plans, and carries out many of the functions of what you think a planning group would do. Uh, one of the things we, we recently have done is we helped develop the green guidelines for the rebuilding for the state of Louisiana after Katrina. Um, our second group we call our civic development group, and they are focused on providing project management services to institutions, not-for-profits, cities, um, who are carrying out major real estate projects. So, for instance, we recently completed working with Cooper Union, the major new academic building that opened last fall um, down in the village. Um, I am the director of our development group. Um, our development group is um, primarily focused on doing residential and um, mixed, um, mixed use projects. Um, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then finally, we have the Rose Smart Growth Investment Fund, which is purchasing buildings nationwide. Um, and then once we've purchased them, we focus specifically on how to green them, how to essentially rebrand them, and then we own and operate them in the long term, benefiting from the uh, cost savings that come from carrying out a green retrofit. And frankly, also very much from the rebranding that happens once a building has been identified as sort of a green, you know, healthy place to work. So for instance, on the slide, is the Vance Building, um, which is this beautiful old 1920s uh, office building in Seattle that we purchased, we greened, we re dramatically reduced its operating costs, and we also rebranded it that it is now literally the center for sort of environmental, not-for-profit um, groups in Seattle. And during the current economic downturn, it actually has maintained its rents significantly higher than what has been the norm for the last couple of years in Seattle. And I think it's you know, completely attributable to this sort of green strategy. So I want to just talk about sort of three types of affordable housing that we're currently engaged in and show projects that reflect them. So the first group um, is what I would call 100% affordable housing, and which is building off a wonderful legacy that we have in New York City for very cost-effectively delivering affordable housing units. Um, what we have found in New York City is that by far the most cost-effective way to produce affordable housing is using block and plank construction. Um, and you, all over New York City, you can see you know, tens of thousands of units in mid-rise buildings that use this construction. And so what we've tried to do is figure out, you know, without throwing out the baby with the bathwater, how can we really start with what has become a really you know, tried and true, proven how affordable housing delivery technology, but deliver buildings that perform significantly more green at hopefully a cost premium of maybe one or two percent. You know, and so here are two buildings that are examples of that. One is uh, David and Joyce Dinkins Gardens um, that we did in partnership with the Harlem Group, Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement. It opened a couple years ago. And below that is a building that we just completed with the Fortune Society, a wonderful not-for-profit that um, provides reentry services for people coming out of the criminal justice system. And this is a building that has 114 units. It's a mix of straight-ahead affordable housing, um, and combined with units reserved for people who have come out of the prison system, gone through transitional housing, and are now finding their first sort of permanent housing after, after going through the sort of reentry process. The second sort of group of buildings are mixed income buildings, which we're, we're, very, we're particularly interested in, in uh, developing. And so the two examples I will give of that um, is a building that we finished last May that's currently leasing up. Um, the Tapestry. It's located on East 124th Street and 2nd Avenue. Um, it is a building that participated in a city program called the 50-30-20 program. And what that is, is it, it's a, it provides city subsidies in order to develop buildings that are 50% market rate, 30% moderate income, and 20% affordable. 
Um, and so the 185 units are addressing all of those particular income groups. Um, below it is uh, Metro Green, which is the first of three buildings that we're doing right adjacent to the Stamford, Connecticut train station. Um, the first phase, because of requirements that came for providing affordable housing in the redevelopment area, is entirely, uh, is 100% affordable. It's 50 units of affordable housing. The second building, which we're currently under construction with, is a mixed income building. The third building will actually be a straight ahead market rate building. Um, the, the final sort of class of buildings, and something that BOMI will speak to as well, is you know, what is really an urgent problem, and that's figuring it out how to green the enormous stock of, of affordable housing that currently exists in New York City and elsewhere. And so two examples I'll give of that are two projects we currently have under construction. Um, the first one are 10, you know, just prototypical tenement buildings located on West 135th Street. It's right across from the YWCA, quite a historic building there, um, which all together contain 198 units. Um, the Rose Smart Growth Fund actually purchased them, um, and now we're taking them through a greening exercise, and our goal will be to uh, um, own it and maintain this as 100% affordable housing, you know, for, for, the, for the foreseeable future. Um, the second project is a project that's also currently under construction, which is a wonderful, it's actually two buildings um, in White Plains. It's uh, supportive housing for women. It's the only uh, um, supportive housing for, you know, specifically for women in Westchester County. Um, it's about 200 units that we're just finishing renovation of one of the two buildings, and we'll be starting the renovation of the second building very shortly. And then just my final image is actually to um, give an image that goes with the uh, project that was referenced earlier. This is a project that's currently under construction. Um, it's actually already up to the fifth or sixth floor at this point. And this is the Via Verde project in the South Bronx. Um, this is 222 units, um, all 100% all affordable housing, but at a mix of um, incomes and actually a mix of types. One third is home ownership, two thirds is rental. And, you know, and this is for us a very exciting project in that you know, it was literally in response to a competition, a, city, a competition sponsored by the city and the AIA and actually Enterprise was part of that as well, where the idea was really um, you know, give us examples of what you believe could be the next generation of green affordable housing. And we're very excited that in about a year and a half there will be a built example of what was our vision. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Bomi Young's work is extremely important because um, she's taking ideas about affordability and sustainability and really taking them to scale. So her work isn't about affecting one building but many buildings and being able to provide programs and assistance to not just a single owner but a myriad of owners. And so uh, particularly her work in relation to the existing housing stock um, is, is just extremely critical to us moving forward as a sustainable city. So, Bomi. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, so I'm gonna, oop. Mm, great. Um, so I just, for those of you who are not familiar with Enterprise, Enterprise is a national affordable housing nonprofit um, that has been working to help low-income Americans move up and out of poverty for over a quarter century. We do that by bringing capital solutions and policy leadership. Um, the, in 2004, Enterprise was uh, the first national uh, affordable housing organization to bring forth a green building pilot program. It was envisioned as a five-year pilot and was um, built around a green building standard for affordable house, specifically designed for affordable housing. Now, in 2004, um, LEED had just come out with what uh, eventually ended up being the LEED uh, for, new, uh, for commercial new construction. Um, and so uh, the Enterprise Green Communities Criteria was uh, really the first national standard uh, for multifamily green building. Um, in 2009, as we were heading towards the close of the, the fifth year of the pilot, um, we released a study that looked back on the projects that had adopted green communities. Um, the study basically found that, well, one of the questions that the study asked was, um, what, what's the, is there some sort of additional cost to building green and, and, and what magnitude um, is that cost premium? Um, the study found that it costs a little less than $2,000 per unit to implement the energy and water measures. Those are the measures that actually have direct financial payback. Um, and that the life, total life cycle uh, savings attached to those measures uh, was almost $5,000. So in other words, those energy and water measures actually uh, generated almost $3,000 of 
savings uh, that could go toward other greening measures that perhaps don't have direct uh, financial uh, benefits. Um, the other thing that the study found that was very interesting um, is that, in general, um, moderate rehab projects um, have a lower cost premium for meeting the green communities criteria and that in, ha, are in general experiencing better return on investments for, those, for, for that investment that, that's made. So what I mean by moderate rehab is uh, basically things that you think of as, as you know, sort of normal rehab. It's um, it, efficient uh, water saving fixtures, it's energy efficient equipment, it's uh, addressing lighting, um, basic ventilation measures, um, boiler and hot water heater uh, replacement or repair as needed. So things that buildings as they age will, will tend to have to replace at the end of life in any case. Um, this is all good news because in New York, much of our building stock is old. Um, as you can see, more than half of the buildings, uh, you know, the residential buildings in New York were built uh, before the war. Um, and a, a great number of these are also small buildings. Um, and here, by small, I mean small, uh, f with fewer than 50 units. So a lot of the portfolio that Enterprise works with in New York falls into this category of both old and small. Um, we're talking about buildings that uh, fall between uh, 4 to four, 49 units in size and built before 1947. Um, and if you look at you know, what that population looks like uh, across the board in, in New York City, um, that's, that's one in seven units of housing that, that meets that description of being sort of old and small, um, and about 25% of the rental stock. So what does it actually take to, to successfully uh, carry through energy efficient moderate rehabs? Well, we're thinking about uh, some of the partners that we've worked with on these, these sorts of projects, and I think that there, there are some crucial steps in planning. Um, the first step would be to identify within the building portfolio uh, which of the buildings are really the energy and water hogs and, uh, and therefore present uh, particularly juicy opportunities for saving. Um, and you do that by measuring actual performance in the buildings, uh, not just looking at what you're spending for utility, but how much energy those buildings are consuming and for what. The second step would be to um, assess the organizational capacity for carrying through energy efficiency rehabs. This is, I think, particularly important if you're looking to participate in a, pro in a, in a program like weatherization um, that has very strict uh, timeline requirements. Um, and, and the point there is not just to figure out what you can and can't do. The idea is to identify the areas where you might need additional capacity. Um, the third item is to cultivate the relationship with tenants. Um, when you're doing a moderate rehab, you're doing it with tenants in place. You'll need to access those units, and it's very important that you're working with folks uh, not only to get access, but so that the tenants understand the benefits that are being delivered through these investments and that they are invested in, in continuing to, to live in those buildings um, you know, to, to keep them operating uh, at high efficiency. Um, and then the fourth step would be to understand uh, where they are, you know, to the extent that you need subsidies to make some of these projects work, um, to, to identify what those sources are be, what would be. So we're doing all of that at Enterprise, and I realize that y'all aren't going to really be able to read this chart. But um, basically, you know, the, there are, if you divide these things up into sort of three uh, steps before construction, um, you know, those are basically the, the items that we talked about um, a second ago. Um, I, the only point I want to make here is that, you know, this process of doing green preservation doesn't end with construction. Um, of course, you need, you know, uh, to plan well and to have good quality control during construction and make sure that the measures that you um, want to install are being installed properly. But, you know, it goes beyond that because once those um, uh, efficiency, efficiency improvements have been made, that the, the building operator and the tenants have to then operate that building, um, you know, for another 30 years in order to, for, for, the, for those investments really to uh, deliver the savings that um, they promise. So, um, oh, okay. Uh, so the, the 
and so that, well, that's my story on energy efficiency retrofits. I do want to leave um, one other thought about policy, uh, green building policy in general, and that's that, um, you know, for affordable housing, um, we're well on our way uh, to being able to say that, uh, ha that affordable housing is green housing. The map that you're looking at here shows all of the states that implement or that require um, some sort of third-party green building program like Enterprise Green Communities or LEED or have adopted uh, aspects of the, of green, specific aspects of green uh, into their low-income housing tax credit allocation plans. So this is just a proxy for say, you know, looking at green building policy across the country, but as, as you can see, the entire map is at least light green, which is very good news, and it did not look this way five years ago. I do want to pose one sort of policy question at, at, at the end, um, and that's, you know, we have a lot of resources coming into energy efficiency, and they're coming in uh, via agencies that deal with energy efficiency or energy in general, not necessarily through housing agencies. Um, weatherization program for, is sort of the prime example. That's a program of uh, the Department of Energy. Um, and there, although there is a partnership between DOE and HUD uh, currently, um, the program is, uh, the DO, well, the DOE folks will tell you that it is an energy efficiency program, not a housing program. So the question I wanted to pose on the policy end is, you know, how can energy efficiency financing work within the uh, you know, context of um, the housing delivery system that we already have in place, which is very well articulated and uh, very sophisticated in the way that it's able to move um, investments in affordable housing. Thank you. So I wanted to just um, start with uh, sort of the obvious question, which is that everyone, it, in, and in this town, this is kind of amazing, right? Everyone pretty much agrees that affordability and sustainability are like, they're at least good words, they're good things to go for. Um, yet, it isn't widely applicable everywhere, um, despite all of these efforts. So what actually are the obstacles to you know, seeing more um, affordable housing, green construction, but also rehabilitation? Um, or you know, any other efforts that would help to advance sort of a housing stock to become more green. Um, what do you see as, are the biggest obstacles? I mean, Paul, you sort of try to get these things built every day, so. Well, I mean, I have to start by saying that, you know, I feel as though New York City is maybe the easiest place to build green affordable housing. And in my, you know, working hard to advance green affordable housing, um, I feel as though it's actually every year gotten easier and easier. So I, I think that there's a lot of good news in terms of what is expected here in New York. Um, and what's interesting for me is I actually um, serve in some uh, councils that actually have more of a national focus. And I'm always sort of bringing up New York City examples to sort of how this could be rolled out more nationally. Um, I, you know, it's, I, I think one of the things that is the best tool that we have here is we have, it feels like almost instantaneous information dissemination. So when any one building or any one project actually has a really good idea, it seems like instantly everyone's sort of picking up on that. It's a relatively small community that's building affordable housing. And so I, I do feel as though, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be saying what the problems are, but I, I more want to say to what extent I actually feel that we should feel proud of sort of the contribution that we're that we're making to advancing, you know, sort of affordable housing, not just here in New York, but nationwide. Um, now, that being said, the, the one thing I would say is that there it seems to be, particularly in the current economic climate, you know, a really intense focus on this idea of sort of energy performance, bottom line, how am I going to get energy savings out of a building, and, and that that's what all green should be focused on. And I, the thing that I'd like to remind everybody of is to what extent in affordable housing, I think energy efficiency is, yes, important, but I think, you know, there are so many other benefits that I think we shouldn't lose sight of. And so, to give an example of this on the Via Verde project, which is currently um, under construction, um, prior to the city coming out with its competition RFP for that project, they actually went to the local community and said, you know, we have this parcel in the South Bronx, we're thinking of doing this RFP, what is it, you South Bronxians, that is most important to you that you would most like to see us include in our RFP for, you know, figuring out what the next generation of green affordable housing should be? And their overwhelming response was, give us a healthy place to live. 
and they were totally focused on the high asthma rates at that point. Um, that's continued, but now there's an even additional focus on obesity, um, on the lack of access to healthy food, to all sorts of things that, you know, the trying to prevent smoking. I mean, just all sorts of things that actually made where Lonka people were living very unhealthy and, you know, really something that was really undermining the health of their children. So I, I just want to say that I think that one thing is this sort of myopic vision on just energy efficiency and saving costs, I think is just in no way, you know, sort of showing what is, I think, one of the real benefits of green affordable housing. So a, a lot of these projects, though, Paul, that you're talking about are dependent on government financing. Um, and in a time of shrinking resources, I mean, I guess, you know, Bowman, in, in your work, I mean, should the government still be subsidizing sort of big new construction green projects if they could do, you know, 10 moderate rehabs for the price of one unit? I mean, how, how sh in a time of shrinking resources, um, where really should the priorities be? Well, um, yeah, I think that a lot of the, you know, a lot of what drives that um, is obviously just the market availability of capital and where folks want to make those investments, right? But, um, you know, and I do think that there is a great need to rehabilitate housing. Um, you know, the vast majority of the housing that we have in New York City right now is already here, right? They're going to continue to be here. Um, and, and we do have an obligation to, um, you know, pay attention to, to these projects that sometimes, you know, are, are not necessarily the sexiest projects, right? I think a lot of folks who associate um, green building with you know, solar panels and green roofs and all these things. They do that because that's, you know, it's, it's a t something tangible that you can take pictures of and you can go and visit. Um, but really where you get both the health benefits um, that Paul was talking about um, and the energy efficiency benefits are in things that are really hard to show in a building. It's in the appropriate air ceiling. It's in, in the uh, ventilation be system being designed well and actually working. Um, and, and those things are frankly just not very sexy, right? But that's really where the hard work is. It's making sure that we're doing, you know, the air sealing, the in insulation, the, the ventilation, um, and, and that it's all getting done well. Right, right. I think, um, we'll, Carolyn, yeah, go ahead, please, go. yes. Um, I'd like to key off of something Bomi said. I'd like to make an unsexy point and a sexy point. And on the un <laughs> unsexy point, getting back to your original question, um, you know, New York was built by tens of thousands of small builders um, working on their own and working in a very entrepreneurial and individual fashion. And it would be very useful if the city, if the Bloomberg administration really thought seriously about looking again at their zoning regulations and their permitting procedures to unleash the energy that's out there to permit more extensive building, particularly in the boroughs. And then the sexy point that I, or I think of it as sexy, that I'd like to make is there are certain ideas that have just taken off in other sections of the country, one of which is uh, live work, right, by which um, small manufacturers and artists and individuals are allowed to work in their living space. And we have a certain amount of it in New York. I mean, Red Hook's one of the um, best examples, I think. But why shouldn't we have it all over the city? Because live work is a chic new, a relatively new idea today, but actually it's the 19th century way that New York was built. And I don't see why we shouldn't return to that right. wholeheartedly. I agree. Um, we have a few minutes. I wanted to see if, if any, there are questions from the audience, which of course I I'm completely blinded, so I can't even. Yeah. Yes, well, please. Yes, I have a question uh -huh. um, for Julia Vitulo Martin. Um, Do you have to people to identify me? To what extent? Yeah. Can, can you just say who you are? My name is Larry Galata. Um, you know, we do have live work. We have the we loft do. buildings. Yeah. We do. They were pioneered we some, yeah. in New York, and yeah. we have a loft law, which has been recently expanded. Um, smaller units, um, the reproduction rate in Manhattan for children is a negative number. I could see um, but we smaller know from, units in Manhattan. We know Manhattan. from Joe yesterday, from Joe yeah. Salvo yesterday, with his yeah. demographic 
presentation that we have a population explosion of babies right. in the boroughs. That's true. Right. Yeah. Do you have a question? Just because we have very little time. Yeah. To what extent is organized years. crime and corruption in the building industry and its component uh, interface with the building department being factored in your analysis of building costs? And are you advocating the busting up of trade unions? Um, in response to the second question, no. Um, but we are advocating seriously looking at work practices and jurisdictional disputes and trying to, and you know, simple things like most people in this room um, get paid um, at the, when they arrive at their workplace. They don't get paid when they arrive in the rough jurisdiction of their workplace. So simple things like, um, you know, not getting paid when you arrive at the work shanty, but getting paid when you arrive at your construction site. We're looking at those kinds of issues in New York. As for the mob, I think there's no question but that certainly historically the mob has been a problem in con the construction industry in New York. And if you Google, you will come across an extraordinary number of citations and indictments and horrifying practices. And, you know, it's there. Yes. Uh, John Petro from the Trump Major Institute. Um, my question is about the packa package of uh, uh, legislation passed by the City Council last year about green uh, requirements for existing buildings. Um, I want to ask the panel, um, before that legislation was passed, part of the uh, package was, was taken away, the, the, the part that would have mandated or required building owners to make certain changes if it would have turned out to be profitable for them. Um, there was some resistance to that idea. I was wondering if the panel could uh, address whether or not it's appropriate for local governments to put in strict requirements given the, uh, the increasing cost of energy, uh, the externalities, the environmental benefits. To what, point, uh, to what extent should cities be more aggressive with uh, requirements and regulations? Well, I guess I guess I would I, I I would say I mean obviously these are all trade-offs, right? And and one of the problems that we've got in New York, and I and I think and probably Fomi and Paul could speak to how much it's a problem nationally is, our our financial lending institutions have also not kept up with a lot of the invest now in more green technology because there will be savings later, and so you you definitely have a mismatch in terms of being able to get construction financing. Um, for either you know some rehab work, but certainly for new construction, um, that's going to have a, a, a later payoff, and I know that that's a continuing challenge. So I think there always has to be a balance, as there does not just about green. It's health and safety. It's fire. It's you know there's a million things that are regulated in terms of particularly housing construction um, that try, have to balance kind of public safety and public purpose goals against the objectives of not completely destroying um, the ability of the private sector to obtain capital in order to accomplish something. So. I mean, I think what was preserved were requirements for sort of um, uh, benchmarking and giving information of building performance. Right. And I think that one of the things that Gerilyn's alluding to is part of the reason that I think there's been difficulty in developing sort of loan programs based on energy savings is the lack of data. So I'm, I'm frankly happy that at least that was included. I, I think that everybody right now is craving a body of data that could then be used as the basis for actually implementing certain programs. Right. So we're going to get the hook because our time is over, but there's one more person patiently waiting. Andrew from the Center for Urban Pedagogy in Brooklyn. I guess this yeah. is a question for the left, left half of the panel. Um, I'm interested in, in Julie's concept of sustainability, and I wonder what's the most sort of economically efficient in terms of, or economically sustainable in terms of uh, units per unit of public outlay uh, to create uh, apartments for lower income New Yorkers? I mean, you have public housing, you have subsidies to families like Section 8, and then you have the developer subsidies like 8020, 421A, et cetera. What, what's the most economically efficient way to provide those units? Or do you think it's possible through policy reforms to um, lower construction costs enough to increase supply so it, and lower rents and reach, you know, those families um, that way. Wow, that's our final question. I guess. Um, <laughs> wow, we, um, well, I would hope the latter in the sense that, you know, Geraldine's organization, Citizens Housing and Planning Council, 
was created in one of the great eras of policy thinking in the country in uh, the 1930s when the you know really thoughtful people, the reformers, put all of their energy into thinking about this question. And I think one of the tragedies of our time is that the, the, the energy, there's the, the, the dominant energy is no longer uh, in the direction of how can we provide the best possible housing at the lowest possible cost for the most number of people without relying on government subsidy. And it's not that I'm against government subsidy because I think there are many markets in which it's just simply needed. But in and of itself, it actually has a tendency to drive up a tremendous number of costs in part because of you know, Davis-Bacon and federal regulations and the interface of various governmental forces. And I would really love to see, I mean, I suppose it's just bizarre in today's world to say you'd like to see a return to the 30s, but I'd like to see a return to the days of the great reformers in which this, your question was the, became the dominant question of the day. Well, I'd really like yes. to thank our panel and, and the audience for being very patient. and. Um, I hope that you found it as informative as I did. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Boy, what a hell of a last question.